Hello, welcome to the first event in our 2024 Diverse Perspectives in Digital Media and Design Speaker Series. To paraphrase James Baldwin, nothing can be changed until it is faced. This is certainly true of the inequities that have historically shaped the entertainment industry and design industry, both on screen and behind the scenes. We would like to begin today's event by acknowledging that the land on which we gather here in Stores, Connecticut is the territory of the Mohegan, Manchtucket Pequot, Eastern Pequot, Scaticoke, Golden Hill Paguset, Nipmunk, and Lenape peoples who have stewarded this land throughout the generations. We thank them for their strength and resilience in protecting this land and aspire to uphold our responsibilities according to their example. Today's event, Breaking the Peripheral Barrier as the Other Brown Designer, will feature a presentation by our guest speaker, Archina Shekara, followed by a Q&A featuring questions from the virtual audience. Please take advantage of the YouTube chat box to submit questions for our guests, which we will try to answer during the discussion. My name is Heather Elliott Famalaro, and I'm a digital artist and documentary filmmaker, and most importantly, the department head for the Digital Media and Design Department here at the University of Connecticut. We are a young department founded in 2013, which has rapidly grown to over 350 uh, undergraduate and graduate students and 26 full-time faculty. We have seven undergraduate concentrations, uh, across the full digital media spectrum from film production, animation, interactive web design, business, and humanities at both the stores and Stanford campuses. And in our department, we value and celebrate our students' diverse backgrounds, and we support their development both as individuals and as professional media creators. Now, in its fourth year, the Diverse Perspectives in Digital Media and Design Speaker Series is one celebration of these shared values. Now, on to tonight's show. It is my extreme pleasure to welcome today's co-host, Professor Clarissa Seglio, and DMD Web and Interactive Media Design students Zoe Ori and Kaylee Frieden. Clarissa Seglio is a U.S. cultural historian trained in the interdisciplinary field of American studies who works at the intersection of museum studies, public history, and digital humanities. Much of her research focuses on the role that artifacts, material, visual, and digital, play in constructing national and social imaginaries within the context of museum work. Her book, A Cultural Arsenal for Democracy, the World War II Work of U.S. Museums, published by University of Massachusetts Press in 2022, traces how, from the 1930s through to the immediate post-war years, the fledgling ideal of the museum as a social instrument, active in current affairs, led to new modes of storytelling through exhibition craft. Through her teaching and research, Seglio also collaborates with museums, libraries, and communities on interdisciplinary public-facing projects that engage diverse audiences in top topics of contemporary concern. Thanks so much, Heather. I'm really excited to kick off our fourth season with such an exciting speaker and topic tonight. And I'm also happy to introduce our two student co-hosts, Zoe Ori and Kaylee Frieden. Zoe is a junior in our in digital media and design with a concentration in web interactive media. With a multiple disciplinary background, her work spans graphic design, web design, UI, UX, and more. She is passionate about creating immersive user experiences and compelling work that makes a difference, as well as collaborating with diverse teams. Welcome, Zoe. Thank you guys, I'm really happy to be here too. And we've got Kelly Frieden, who is also a DMD junior concentrating in web and interactive media design. She's active on campus serving as marketing club, uh, marketing chair of a club called Confetti for Kids and is also the VP of recruitment information of Alpha Chi Omega sorority. She works well on teams and loves to learn new things. So welcome Kelly. Thank you and thank you for having me. I'm happy to be here. And now let me turn the virtual mic over to you, Clarissa. Thank you. Ani, there we go. Well, uh, again, we are thrilled to welcome this evening's guest, Archana Shekara. She is professor of graphic design, co-director of ethnic studies program and creative director of Design Streak Studio, a research-based social innovation lab focusing on human-centered service design at Illinois State University. Shikara is uh, 27, I'm sorry, that's the last name, uh, but Professor Shikara is 
has 27 years of professional experience designing for diverse industry clients. And she uses design to build cross-cultural understanding, acceptance, and respect. As a socio-cultural researcher, she investigates her transnational identity as an Indian American by understanding racial equity and decoloniality through a brown cultural lens and creates cultural awareness using ethnographic narratives. Her medium for creative expression takes on various forms, such as type design, curating immersive participatory experiences, and interactive installations using mixed and various emerging digital media that evoke multi-sensory responses. Her scholarship and in teaching includes design pedagogy related to cross-cultural awareness and identity, social justice, and community engagement. Her teaching and research have been featured in peer-reviewed national and international academic and professional publications and conferences. For example, she was featured in the national IAGA's One Designer, One Work, and we'll pop that link into the YouTube channel for everyone to check out that talk. Additionally, uh, the founder and chair of the South Asian Design Educators Alliance, which aims to promote and share South Asian design histories, pedagogies, and perspectives globally. She is a board member of the award-winning The People's Graphic Design Archive and has received an MFA in graphic design from the University of Illinois at Urbana-Champaign and a BFA in painting from the State University of New York in New Paltz. For more information about her work, we'll be posting several links, including to the HER project, which stands for Human Empathy and Respect, into the chat as you can access those materials. And at this point, I have the pleasure to turn things over to our guest speaker. Thank you so much, uh, everyone. And it's a pleasure to join you all. And I'm going to share my screen. Um, can everybody see this? Thank you. And I'm just going to go and It's full screen now. Thank you so much. So hello and namaste. I am going to read from my notes so I can be very concise. So hello and namaste. Good evening, everyone. I thank Dr. Clarissa Seglio for inviting me to present for diverse perspectives in digital media and design speaker series at the University of Connecticut. Thanks to department chair, Professor Heather Elliott Pumilaro for the kind introductions. And then the wonderful students, Zoe and Kaylee, thank you so much. And all of the students and listeners, it's lovely meet, uh, to meet everyone virtually. I'm honored to share my journey as the other brown designer in the United States, embracing my intersectional identity while navigating through various array of roles. As a sociocultural researcher, transdisciplinary artist and designer, educator, community activist, immigrant, woman, and mother with transcontinental roots, transnational identity, and two homes. My talk will focus on my various trajectories, but they all converge and cross paths at different levels. It's complex, challenging, chaotic, complicated, and a compound of ideas and concepts. I would like to begin with a quote from Dr. Vin Vijay Prasad's book, The Karma of Brown Folk. Certain non-whites such as Asians and Latinos appear in this discourse as fundamentally immigrant, despite their generation's long presence in the United States. As immigrants, it is claimed Asians and Latinos cannot assimilate into US society. So they should be sent home. In an essay published in 1969, Martin Luther King Jr. wrote that white America 
is still poisoned by racism, which is as native to our soil as pine trees, sagebrush, and buffalo grass. Brown is often used as an umbrella term to encompass various ethnic and racial groups that do not fit aptly into the categories of white or black. Brown identity in the United States involves self-identification of individuals with origins or heritage from South Asia, Latin America, various Middle Eastern countries, and beyond. The term brown is expansive. Each community within this broad category brings unique traditions, experiences, identities, languages, customs, and practices. Individuals with a brown identity often share the challenges of being perceived as the other, and the collective experience involves grappling with stereotypes, prejudices, and discrimination based on factors such as their appearances, names, or cultural practices. The definition of brown identity continues to evolve as communities engage in dialogues and advocate for their visibility and acknowledgement. So who am I? So before I say who am I, I want to know, I want to tell you what country I come from. So I'm an immigrant from India whose country's name was given by the Greeks and I'm a Hindu, a word given by the Persians. The British Raj occupied India for more than two centuries and used the name Hinduism and India or Hindustan and India simultaneously. The people of India have accepted these names for centuries. However, the current discussions around adapt adopting Bharat as the official name for the country and referring to Hinduism as Sanatana Dharma are part of ongoing debates about national identity, cultural heritage, and decolonization of language. The outcomes will depend on the perspectives of different communities, political decisions, and public sentiments. Only time will tell how these discussions will shape the official nomenclature and how people will identify themselves in years to come. I'm a South Indian from Mysuru, Karnataka, and grew up in the city during the 70s and 80s with one television channel exposed to the outside world only through newspapers, books, and cinema. Mysuru is a welcoming city with pleasant weather, magnificent palaces, cuisines, cultures, and friendly people. The city is known for its tourism. It is a destination to learn Ashtanga Yoga, visit the marvelous Vrindavan Gardens and the Grand Mysore Palace. Since the late 1300s, Mysuru was ruled by the Wadayar dynasty and the city has remained as a center for art, literature and music. I grew up in a liberal Orthodox South Indian family, so crossing the threshold of my house was only for school or painting or Bharatnatyam classes. Art was fun, exciting and liberating. So during my childhood, I found great excitement in playing Scrabble and immersing myself in pages of the Oxford Dictionary. While such pastimes may be considered unexciting by today's children, I found them to be intellectually stimulating. One aspect I particularly cherished was the meticulous arrangement of the text on the page, the lines, the subtle irre irregularities of spacing or the rags, and the beauty of both handwritten and printed gray page. I possessed a comprehensive collection of stamps and currencies, along with numerous local Amrachitakata, Chandamama, and Indrajal comic book series during my childhood. My great grandfather, a storyteller, shared captivating narratives from the Ramayana and Mahabharata epics. These experiences served as my early exposures to Indian visual and auditory cultures, marking my initial encounters with typography and imagery. The majority of stories within the comic books were vehicles for imparting wisdom, containing aphorisms, and illustrating the eternal struggle between good and evil. The recurring theme emphasized the in it, that individuals adhering to their dharma or righteousness would ultimately triumph. Across these moral tales, devas or celestial beings were portrayed as virtuous individuals with fair complexions, while demons were depicted as antagonists with dark brown skin. Male deities such as Krishna, Shiva, and Vishnu were often represented in blue, symbolizing the vastness of the sky, space, or the universe. 
India often is romanticized with its diverse cuisines, languages, landscapes, and religions, and the Republic scuffles with significant divides, notably between the North and the South. The historical narrative suggests that the Aryan migration from Central Asia gradually pushed the Dravidian population southward around 4,000 years ago, creating distinctions. Aryans are conventionally depicted with fair skin, while the indigenous Dravidians are characterized by darker skin tones. The imprint of colonization has further deepened this divide. The societal fascination for fair skin as a symbol of beauty and aristocracy, and often associating dark or brown skin with mediocrity or labor class remains deeply ingrained. Despite growing awareness about equity and inclusion, the preference for fair complexion persists and dominates the Indian film and advertising industries and matrimonial sections. And here are some of these examples of matrimonial sections. This perception of skin color extends beyond India and is prevalent in various Asian countries. The popularity of skin whitening creams in South and East Asia highlights the impact of colonialism where beauty is defined by Western ideals. It is elite to have fair skin, and the Varnas, loosely translated as caste system, emphasize these categorizations as well. Most people from the Brahmanical heritage are fair skinned and upper class. They were ministers, educators, and priests. The second Varna, Kshatriyas, were rulers and soldiers, and the third Varna, Vaishyas, were traders. The fourth Varna are the Sudras, who are agriculturists and serve the upper Varnas. And the fifth group of people, the Dalits, were excluded and marginalized and were not included in the four Varnas. Isabel Wilkerson, in her book Caste, states, The hierarchy of caste is not feelings of morality. It's about power. Which groups have it and which do not? It is about resources. Which caste is worth of is which caste is seen as worthy of them and which are not? Who gets to acquire and control them and who does not? It is about respect, authority, and assumptions of competence. Who's accorded these and who is not? Despite the official abolition of the caste system, it remains an open secret and continues to be practiced covertly, often employed to maintain bloodline, purity, and power dynamics. Being identified as brown comes with challenges. Varna classifications, racial distinctions, and pre prevailing power structures. I have carried this burden of being categorized as brown. From the fourth Varna, an amalgamation of Aryan and Dravidian race. However, in an, in an Indian context, I blend in me with many others who carry similar burdens. I recall my understanding of the United States when I first arrived in 1991. I was fascinated to settle in a country that I had read in books and seen on television and films. Even though I come from an upper middle class family and have lived a privileged life in India, I have witnessed religious tensions, casteism, racism, colorism, and sexism in India. My perception of the United States appeared to be progressive, and a land where the feminist movement thrived. My high school textbooks did not extensively cover issues of racism, biases, and segregation in the United States. However, my personal observations included Hollywood portrayal of Blacks as criminals, Middle Easterners as terrorists, and Indians as exotic or uncultured. We had learned that slavery was abolished, and Dr. Martin Luther King was inspired by Mahatma Gandhi's practice of ahimsa, that's nonviolence, and George Washington, Abraham Lincoln, and John Kennedy were great presidents. I had a very superficial understanding of the complexities within the United States. The shock of witnessing police brutality towards Rodney King, followed by the riots and protests in Los Angeles and news media, left a profound impact on me. The hate crimes and the derogatory language used to frame Black identity were deeply disturbing. Being brown did not feel safe either. The Dot Busters hate group in Jersey City created an atmosphere of unrest. Things that looked glamorous on the surface had concealed the underlying problems which were deeply rooted and systemic. 
My journey as an art student reflects a complex mix of experiences, the appreciation and acceptance alongside marginalization, stereotyping, and exclusion. There was no sense of community or belonging. A few faculty members were understanding and empathetic. This experience made me resilient and determined to excel. As an Asian immigrant, I'm constantly questioned when I use the word Asian to define my identity. Growing up in India, we considered ourselves as Asians and Indians, but living in the United States has made me become aware of how the dominant cultural groups categorizes Asians. In this country, I'm labeled as an Asian Indian since the word Asians are used for people from East Asia. However, the US census form asks us to check the Asian box. I cannot call myself an Indian because historically a person from the dominant community mislabeled groups in the new land as Indians. And as a society, we persist in perpetuating this misnomer. While I might be considered fair or tan complexion by Southern Indian standards, but I'm brown. And the term brown is used, often used for people from Latin America. So I'm a South Asian whose borders were drawn by the dominant and powerful groups of people. And my identity is not a simple check in the box. So where do I fit? Embracing a Desi identity, the term Desi is used to categorize people of South Asian origin. However, it can be limiting as it often associates with an identity centered around India. Desi traditionally means a citizen of a country, in my case, India. As someone living in the United States, I identify as both Desi and Videsi, signifying my connection to my home country and my status as a foreigner in the United States. Desi carries connotations of being local, indigenous, and at times dangerously implies of unadulterated purity. ABCD serves as an acronym for American-born confused Desi, drawing a parallel to being resembled to a coconut brown on the outside and white on the inside. These labels further contribute to the complexities faced by brown immigrants intensifying their struggles with dual identities. Parental expectations related to career choices, the preservation of cultural roots and seeking a community space of belonging. I loved art history, the 20th century abstract expressionism, Dada and the digital movements. My fascination for creative typographies was one of the reasons I wanted to study graphic design. 27 years ago, there were fewer female Indian graphic designers practicing in the U.S. since graphic design was not a common profession that one would pursue. So I asked myself, why do I design? What am I designing? And whose is it for? Enquiry passion and curiosity enveloped with social justice are integral elements for me to create. I'm inspired by life around me and learn every day. As a South Asian Indian brown immigrant woman designer residing in the United States for over three decades, I engage in a critical analysis of my positionality, reflecting on my own experiences, acknowledging my resistance, nurturing my fierce sense of hope, and embracing radical hospitality. I intentionally pause to appreciate the beauty found in gaps and voids. I find gratitude in these moments of breathing, resting in the spatial plateaus and plains as I strive to comprehend the broader meaning of life, creating connections with societies and honor human dignity, humanity, and respect. So the purpose of design and history has been to understand and meet societal needs by offering creative and practical solutions to existing problems. The designing, the designing successful brand identity to propaganda posters, design has inspired, influenced, and changed cultural and political narratives. Today's designers have a greater responsibility to become culturally aware, understand diversity, inclusion, and social constructs since our clients and audiences vary in ethnicity, language, religion, gender, race, and class. So that's the purpose of design. 
So then design is a philosophy of life. So this is how I, de I define it for myself. Design is a philosophy of life in which designers must empathize with and respect the diverse multicultural communities of people we serve. Prior to teaching, I have worked on several design projects for diverse clients, and I have found that clients desire to portray ethnic diversity in their company's print and digital materials as evidence of representation. It's easy and cost effective to download stock photos showcasing individuals of African or Asian descent. Using these types of images in their campaigns, companies believe that they have succeeded in demonstrating diversity. As I continued working, I began to question these assumptions. Was using such images truly speaking to a diverse ethnic audience? Were these effective? Do they communicate anything? I've also observed that several international magazines and companies have exotified and racially stereotyped people or communities that are considered the other in their promotional materials. Is this morally right? What are they really gaining by marginalizing and exotifying certain groups of people? I have witnessed the increasing influence of Asian culture and art in Western societies. Its socioculture is influenced by the Eastern way of life in terms of food, home decor, and Eastern practice of wellness as in Tai, tai Chi, yoga, and meditation. The yoga has become a casual word in the West and is practiced as an exercise. It has seemingly lost its profound meaning, which is attaining the path to reach the divine. Wellness centers offer goat yoga, beer yoga, and even naked yoga classes. These concepts are far removed from its original meaning, and yet it is accepted and is taken for granted. These types of new vocabularies will continue to emerge if there is no deeper meaning or understanding of its roots. The stereotyping, exotifying, and marginalizing of cultures and people continues, and I, and I began to question design and its ethics, my purpose, my understandings, and my actions. As, as designers, what are our shared responsibilities? How do we design with authenticity? How can we familiarize ourselves with new languages, methodologies, processes, and tools to communicate with audiences from various cultural backgrounds? How can we engage in designing with cultural sensitivity and awareness? How can design be a platform for building empathy, understanding, and respect? In order to appreciate other cultural identities, we must familiarize ourselves with our own cultural identity. Our behaviors, beliefs, values, and norms. When we are aware of our cultural histories, traditions, practices, and accept our intersecting identities, then we can begin to understand, appreciate, and respect similarities and differences with other cultures. Oftentimes, the perspective of a person with brown skin finds no place at the table, depending on the nature of the conversations taking place. I've noticed that South Asian or Indian art is often viewed as exotic, while vernacularism is sometimes dismissed as kitsch or mere craft. Historically, adherence to bar, bar house principles has been universally considered good design, not only in the West, but also in India. However, this perception is now under global debate as new languages and narratives continue to emerge, challenging the frameworks defined by dominant communities. Good design, as perceived by many, aligns with Eurocentric eye, and good design writing in English caters to the Eurocentric mind. To foster inclusivity, there is a need to transcend these boundaries, creating space for those, for people whose perspectives don't conform to the Euro and U US centric frames. This inclusivity allows for the acceptance and creation of work that's unique and authentic. Hence, what may be deemed good design for one group might not resonate with many others. So, we need to change our mindset from inside out. I perceive design as a powerful catalyst for social cultural change. Over the past seven, 16 years, I have been conducting research in cultural identity and design involving collaborations with various sociologists, anthropologists, historians, and community organizations dedicated to social justice issues. These interdisciplinary collaborations are either self-initiated, client-based, or student projects. Additionally, 
I have actively engaged with several grassroots organizations contributing to cross-cultural dialogues aimed at bridging gaps between underrepresented, marginalized, stereotyped, or other groups. The My Voice project, video project, serves on an exploration of my dual identity, a voice of an Indian American woman, mother and artist, who has navigated and adapted to her surroundings. This project examines my everyday struggle, defined to conform into a predefined cultural framework as I endeavor to preserve Indian values in my daily life. The goal is not only pass these values for future generations to embrace, but also to foster better understanding, acceptance, and respect for diverse cultural identities residing in the West. So I will share the second chapter, and the full video is on my website. Perception of India in the West. India is an overly populated country with people of brown skin draped in saris, who wear red dots on their forehead. It's an exotic land of wild jungles, animals, and birds. It's mystical and spiritual with many gurus teaching yoga and meditation. It is a country that has carved stone temples depicting the Kama Sutra along with various mythical legends of pagan gods. But how is India truly defined? Through sheet clothing and only jewelry? By the Taj Mahal and other lavish palaces? Is it the henna or other exotic spices? Is it hell or paradise? What is Indian culture really? So the voice video project provided a visual platform for articulating the questions faced by the Indian community. And if you want to watch the full video, uh, you're welcome to visit my website. For my graduate thesis project, I explored and presented Indian graphic design rooted in the vernacular. Tanumana is an installation showcasing cultural understanding through food, body, and space. Tanumana is translated as evoking the senses through the mind, the higher level of consciousness. It was an interactive installation designed to immerse audiences in an innovative experience of Indian culture. Audiences became aware of everyday life in India, the, aromatics, the aromatic of spices, visual complexities, perceptions of space, vibrant colors, rich ornamentation, repetition of pattern and parallel sound. Currently, I have been exploring the ritual of making and serving food through narratives based on my heritage, familial traditions, memory, and upbringing. Creating a welcoming space to gather groups of friends or strangers around a table to share a meal is rewarding to me. I perceive this space as organic, vibrant, and sacred. Food often is what brings us together socially. It, it is usually the first level of digesting another culture. So I have been designing immersive, participatory, and sensory experiences to seek community by sharing rice at various settings. Rice is a staple grain in Asian and Latin American communities and is seen as a form of expression. Many cultures use raw and cooked rice in numerous ways, as in food, rituals, worship, charity, and blessings. In South Indian homes, rice is a symbol of abundance and auspiciousness. Anna or rice in a broader sense means grain or food. At Design Inquiry, an international design residency in Maine, I cooked and served four Indian rice dishes which explored cultural influences and amalgamation of cuisines through conquest, socioeconomic disparities, healing, and spiritual attributions of rice. The interactive experience generated conversations about home and transnational identity. I was inspired to deeply unearth one rice dish and hence created Polished Unpolished, a mixed and emerging media installation for the deeply rooted at the Women Made Gallery in Chicago and evolving graphic design exhibition at the University of Wisconsin in Madison. The lush slopes and rectangular paddy fields showcases diverse landscapes, division of labor, land and borders. The social 
The social practice design work invited the general public to eat ganji, a simple rice gruel prepared by me using unpolished rice. The dish was used as a metaphor to address sociocultural stigmas about race, colorism, and economic disparities and initiated unexplored conversations with audiences. I collaborated with Professor Jennifer Gunji, director of Japan House at the University of Illinois in Urbana-Champaign and curated the 10 Ways of Rice. The Experience Design Project is an exploration of Asian cultures as a response to how the Asian community is grouped, simplified, and mostly unseen in the United States. However, most Asian cuisines are pronounced, accepted, and enjoyed. The paradoxical perceptions of visible and invisible, model minority and xenophobia question the dominant cultural understanding of Asian identity and practices. We hosted a two-day event and on the first day, we served a formal sit-down dinner meal with 20 dishes from 10 different Asian countries. India, Japan, China, South Korea, Philippines, Vietnam, Palestine, Lebanon, Turkey, Iran, and Thailand. All the chefs were academics, and we had designers, artists, nutritionists, microbiologists, and psychologists. The second event was hosted outside, which was open to public. All the dishes served from drinks to dessert were made from rice. The grain connected our cultures, binding us in friendship to foster joy, hope, and peace. Donations collected from the event were given to the Midwest Food Bank. There is a QR code on the page, and if you want to read more about the experience that was featured in the local magazine, you're welcome to, like, uh, I have inserted QR codes on certain pages in case you would like to know more. So Dialogues and Dishes is a project collaboration with Meena Khalili, Associate Professor of Graphic Design at the University of South Carolina. She reached out to me since my research focused on sharing ethnographic narratives and, Im and immigration stories through food. We created artwork with our families and mailed them as postcards to friends, inviting them to join our collaboration. The primary goal for the celebratory project is to discover ways to preserve ancestral cultural traditions and generational recipes. Again, here is the QR code for the project, and you're welcome to join our collaboration. So if you're interested, you can scan the QR code through your phone, and otherwise I can mail the QR code uh, to uh, Cursa, and she can share that with you all. So last fall, Women Made Gallery in Chicago invited me to write a call, jury, and curate Mine, Yours, Ours, Kitchen and Familial Stories exhibition. The call invites artists and designers from the United States to submit their distinctive ways in treasuring their traditional food recipes while exploring adaptive methods of cooking. Our kitchen tell our unique story. The way we eat, the ingredients we buy, the utensils we use, the foods we cook and serve, the familiarity of tastes are influenced by our ancestral cultural roots. How is food consumed for sustenance during communal joy or conflict or despair at home or in their communities? How do they bring diverse communities of people together, establish belonging and promote hope through food? The exhibition opened last week in Chicago and uh, there was showcasing 30 artists. And here are some of the, like in the GIF that you see, some of the work. And that was the exhibition promotion poster that I created. And um, I hosted Let's Chat, a social practice design work inviting audiences to eat churmuri, an Indian street food from Karnataka state. The humble churmuri elicits a myriad of intricate tastes its lively textures, bold colors, and uncomplicated ingredients unveil layers of profound meanings. Audiences were asked to respond and unravel in ways both familiar and unknown. These tastes are discoveries that may feel fresh, new, strange, amalgamated or foreign, occasionally evoking a sense of alienation. Yet, within this unfamiliarity resides the authentic, the original, and the novel. These taste memories bind us together, connecting us with our past, our families, our traditions, and our heritages. 
The public immersed themselves in the simple yet complex materiality and contributed their ruminating reflections as phrases that became an integral part of the installation. So this is how the installation looked before. And then once they wrote, uh, and then this is how it ended up being. And then here is the bowl. Uh, I don't have pictures. I It just happened last week. So I don't have the videos yet. And I'm kind of collecting them from the gallery. So I don't have updated images. Being multilingual, I began to observe my thoughts and ways I communicate through speech in multiple languages at the same time. Kannada is my native language, but the colonial language English binds me together with my Indian and non-Indian communities. I have been creating experimental and explorative typography using Kannada and Latin letter forms to denote and unravel unique meanings, being a bit of an avant-garde, and this inquiry and examination has been eye-opening and gratifying. I started the Deepavali card project in 2018. This project also celebrates my bicultural identity, my Kanglish, that's Kannada and English, and Sanskrit mantras or verses from various Upanishads, that's sacred texts, which are spiritual aphorisms promoting peace and harmony. The United States Post Office released a stamp to commemorate Diwali in 2016. It was a wonderful gesture and a great example of diversity and inclusion. President Obama started the tradition of celebrating the festival by lighting a lamp at the White House and offering a prayer for, begin, for bringing light over darkness, goodness, peace, and harmony. I mail about 150 cards with the Diwali stamp to colleagues and peers and have received several kind acknowledgement, acknowledgements. I'm joyful that these cards have touched many hearts. While this project is a socio-cultural and political response to state of matter globally, it has also served as a means to preserve my cultural history and language. I was invited for a group exhibition titled Borders at Illinois Wesleyan University's Mervyn Gallery. It was a call to visually respond to the interviews of children who were held at the US immigration facilities at the US-Mexican borders. As a privileged immigrant who arrived to the United States with a green card, I empathize with the Latino community. Although today's media portrays, tries to portray Latino identity with positive role models, Latino Americans suffer from the effects of racial stereotyping and biases. My project, Colonized Dreams, questioned the American middle class dream of a house with white picket fence. Immigrants arrive to the United States with the hope that they have they can thrive in a country that was built on immigrant labor. The participatory mixed media installation asked audiences to respond to the celebration of having arrived while commemorating the existence and struggles of immigrants who are detained, caged, and stripped of their dignity. As an educator and incorporate one project focusing on cultural identity in every graphic design course, I will be sharing a couple student projects from my graphic design courses. So in my special topics in graphic design course, the Food for Thought project familiarizes students about their cultural heritage, home and familial traditions. Students conduct deeper research about one dish from their ancestral country of origin and trace the food's history, ingredients and relevance. Students create information design posters and video of their cooking the dish and a few students bring their dish to share. Prior to COVID-19, students and I cooked Indian food at a prep kitchen, and students had to write a reflection of, about how the immersive experience helped them to understand another culture. So I'll just play one video. How to make rice, but like step by step. Do I have to do measurements? No, no, I don't. Like estimates. <laughs> Okay. Para empezar, hago aproximadamente dos tazas de arroz. Ah, lo lavo bien, bien lavado, para quitarle un poquito el almidón. 
después de lavarlo um, en un sartén con aceite, se dora el, el arroz en el aceite, uh, más o menos que quede, uh, bueno, que esté un poquito dorado. Dos tomates medianos, uh, un pedazo de cebolla, un ajo, dependiendo la cantidad que vas a hacer. Uh, Le puedes agregar consomé. Consomé en polvo o en cubitos. Y mientras estás dorando tu arroz, mueles eh, el jitomate y el ajo, la cebolla. How to make rice, but like... So because of lack of time, I'm going to move on. Otherwise, it's a lovely project and the student did an amazing job. And this video is also part of the... Um, the exhibition in Chicago. I'll continue. So designing authenticity, Shanghai Normal. That was another project. Our university had a partnership with Shanghai Normal University for five years. This partnership was a wonderful opportunity for students from both countries to learn, connect, interact, and collaborate. I had the privilege to teach typography and special topics in design at both universities. I was interested in discovering how students can navigate and communicate between cultures through typography. Students in both countries were asked to design a Roman letter form with research cultural history and heritage based on one city, town, province in China. Designing Authenticity Shanghai Normal typography-based project enables students from both institutions to become aware of the heritage and cultural identity of China, exploring vernacular designs with Roman letter forms. The project helps students in China to appreciate and reflect upon their cultural identity, while students in the U.S. gain new understandings and respect about Chinese culture. So as a creative and art director of Design Streak Studio, a senior graphic design capstone course at Illinois State University. So the studio is a social innovation research lab, which facilitates an immersive interdisciplinary environment, promoting st student engagement and service learning. We collaborate with diverse community partners, promoting social justice issues each semester. We celebrated the studio lab's 40th um, anniversary last year, I curated Designing Discoveries exhibition at Illinois State's University Galleries. And I would like to share a couple projects from this studio course. And this is, uh, these are some photos that you see from the exhibition. Hey. Through the studio, I conceptualized and proposed an art installation of Thousand Flags to commemorate National Immigrants Day on the ISU Quad in 2021. The installation of flags was a symbol of hope and acceptance, calling for unity and honoring human dignity. The flags on the land is a marker for the living. So this particular statement was said by the renowned graphic designer, Rick Valacenti. Uh, when I shared these images uh, with him, and uh, this is what he said, the flags on the land is a marker for the living. And I thought that was such a, um, it, was a it, was, it was so apt and highly regarded. Um, and respecting whose land we are on. Immigrants are often made to feel invisible and have been a target of hatred and racism in the United States history and xenophobia has escalated in the past few years. I propose the title, I'm here, we are here, we belong. The project was adopted by the campus and broader community. Administrators, including the president and provost and community leaders spoke at the event and, and was shared on social media and YouTube. 
the the goal was to engage students in meaningful civic engagement and activism through design so there is a qr code again and if you're interested in watching uh, what was streamed on youtube you're welcome to so labyrinth project is another project that we did through design streak labyrinth project is a program initiative adopted by the local ywca it is a social entrepreneurship project which empowers women who are working to rebuild their lives after incarceration, selling hand-poured soy candles to become self-sufficient. This project received the Google Impact Award of $75,000 to support the initial material cost. So this was a very interesting project. When I first got this project, uh, all we had was just the, the jar the dark green jar, that's all we had, and some text. And we had literally nothing. So everything was conceptualized. We were co-creating with, uh, with the Labyrinth folks. Uh, and then they took these designs and then they applied for the Google Impact Award and they were awarded uh, $75,000. So this is really uh, amazing that we have in our local community. So the studio proposed ways to humanize and connect with consumers by sharing unique stories of labyrinth women. We needed to be mindful of cost, consider the ease of assembling raw materials, and create simple templates so women of labyrinth can take over the project and follow the project's brand guidelines. The project was a five series of candles for each season and a speciality candle called Serenity. Since the women of Labyrinth were pouring candles by hand, the design team decided to incorporate botanical style illustrations and chose vibrant colors with metaphorical meaning, honoring the women for their perseverance and dedication. Again, I have a QR code if anybody is interested in buying a candle which will help the women out uh, or this uh, Labyrinth made goods out, uh, that would be wonderful. So... Um... The last project I'll be sharing is Breaking Bread Lecture Series, hosted by the McLean County Museum of History, which is local. It is a 10-part program designed to explore stories of migration, immigration, adaptation, appropriation, preservation, and sustentation in McLean County. Since I'm on the planning committee, I propose that we present the series through food. The lecture series were hosted virtually due to the pandemic and hence reached a wider audience. Breaking Bread acknowledged and celebrated diverse cultures by promoting deep understandings and appreciation. It gave us a glimpse into people's homes, lives, and their kitchens and stories. Each lecture presentation accompanied personal recipes shared by the speakers, which was published as a cookbook. These books are sold at the museum for a nominal price. I was honored to host Garam Masala Box, Indian American Cooking on 9-11, the day that changed America and brown Asian people's lives. And again, there is a QR code if you're interested in watching these series. By engaging students in conversations and projects about diverse cultural identities and cross-cultural awareness, I believe enhances students' critical thinking, expands their visual and design vocabulary, provides a holistic understanding of design and its purpose, new respect for theirs as well as other cultural identities, empowering students to engage in social activism as a lifelong responsibility. The visibility of Design Streak Studio has been noticed since I have been presenting at several national and international peer-reviewed conferences featuring the studio's creative process and teaching methodologies. I was interviewed by Megan D, Associate Professor of Graphic Design at Virginia Tech, and Dr. Jessica Mary, Assistant Professor of Graphic Design at Illinois Institute of Technology for their upcoming book, Working with Design Clients, Tools and Advice for Successful Partnership. The book features firsthand accounts from design educators as a resource for students and faculty who are addressing real world client and community projects in their coursework. The book is published by Bloomsbury Publishing, and you can pre-order right now if you're interested. Lastly, while I was writing for my promotion application to full professor, I realized how lonely I had been as a South Asian design educator in the United States. There were not many South Asian graphic design educators when I first started teaching. After much reflection, I randomly searched on Google and reached out to several South Asian design educators to form a community. 
And we are now the South Asian Design Educators Alliance or SADEA. I'm deeply humbled to serve as the organization's founder and elected chair. Again, if you want to know more about Sadia, there is a QR code right there. So there is a platform for South Asian design educators to build a global design community of acceptance and belonging. So there was formed in January 2022, empowering South Asian design educators to share their story, histories, experiences, and perspectives with larger design community. The Alliance strives to address the Eurocentric canon by integrating South Asian narratives as a part of their global design history. It aims to build community with educators and students by providing mentorship and growth. So they are host three biennial events like Design Charcha, Chat Masala, and Chai Time. You can watch these recordings online and feel free to attend future events. Through Sadea, I collaborated with the award-winning the People's Graphic Design Archive and hosted the South Asian Design Adathon event last summer. The archive is considered as the Wikipedia for graphic design. It's not just a documentation of design work, but is an excellent reservoir of cultural, political, and social design histories from global communities. It is diverse and inclusive and is now used in various design history curriculums and broader, co broader courses that present design and society. I'm honored to serve as a board member for the archive starting this year. I'm thrilled to share that we Presented at CAA conference in New York last February, the title of the panel was Decomatizing Pluralities, Visual Cultures of Indian Subcontinent. It was a historic presentation with all Indian panelists talking about Indian graphic design. I was honored to be invited as a discussant by the panel chair, Neeta Verma, Associate Professor of Visual Communications at University of Notre Dame. Last but not least, I wanted to write a design manifesto which documented my purpose. Changing from the inside out, an appeal, a call, a demand for action. I submitted this poster for I Profess, the graphic design manifesto, 20th anniversary traveling juried exhibition. I believe they received 79 entries and accepted 23 entries. I'm honored to share that mine was selected for the traveling exhibition. So, you may ask, what's cooking next? After 14 years of teaching, I took sabbatical last spring and traveled to India, gathering materials for several short and long-term projects. Finding a sense of belonging through Navarasas or nine emotions, using ethnographic cuisine, sense of place, narratives of home, people, and memory. I was awarded the University Research Grant for my type vinyasa project. Vinyasa is arranging typography in a special way within specific structures using native script and Latin letter forms. This is a craft-based research collaboration with basket weaving Medar community in Mysoru. While framing my narrative, I have been consciously considering my positionality. Who gets to share their story? Who is the author? Whose voice and authenticity? My conversations and documentations of their stories will be shared as an artist book where pages weave to form relationships. Another project is about women's right to choose. In 2022, a communal disruption leading to protest in my home state of Karnataka. The Muslim women were asked to remove their hijab before entering their college campus by the Hindu women students since the headgear was not a part of their uniform. This dispute was heard at the Karnataka High Court, which ruled against wearing the hijab on college campuses. The plea went to the Supreme Court of India, which could... Which could um, did not cast a clear vote to allow Muslim women to enter the college premises wearing their hijab. The Muslim women students have discontinued their higher education, and these types of socio-cultural political marginalizations of minoritized communities has escalated globally. The hijab is banned in several countries, and as a Hindu, I'm privileged to wear my sari how, however and whenever I choose. And this disparity has compelled me to explore how invasion, adaptation, assimilation, and cuisines have deepened divides as well as bridged two different cultures and faiths. 
So I have shared numerous insights about my life, designs to studies, professional practice and relationships, all of which touch upon themes of equity, inclusion and representation. For more details about me, please visit my website. And, and now I'm open to questions. Uh, so whatever questions you have. Great. Well, thank you so much. It is not a pun to say that this has been a rich feast. And I am grateful that the recording of this presentation will be freely available online here on the YouTube channel. So many visual, thematic, methodological layers that this is a presentation that I know I need to rewatch multiple times to access those different layers. So we will go longer than our normal time because I really do want to get to some key questions uh, from our class. Uh, these were prepared in advance. And I again want to remind our virtual audience, please put any questions you may have for our speaker in the chat. We will be sure to include those as we spend uh, maybe uh, 15 more minutes so that we can have some Q&A. And I will turn it over to our co-hosts, Zoe and Kaylee, to lead us in those questions. Thank you so much for such an amazing presentation. Um, I can start off with our first question that we have. Um, were there ever points in your career where you struggled to speak up for diversity and inclusion, or is this something that you've always been able to be outspoken about? I came to this country as a 19-year-old, very naive, and I shared that in my presentation as well. So there was no language back then in terms of diversity, equity, inclusion. All of these languages are new right? And, and it's great. So then we can, we as designers who are looking at sociocultural design and can add on to this. But back then I was looking at um, anthropologists, sociologists, uh, historians for inspiration and reading books and then getting ideas from whatever they were writing. I was trying to make them, right? As makers, as designers. But um, coming to Living in this small town in Bloomington, like when we moved to Bloomington, Illinois, central Illinois, it's really, it's a small town, uh, corn fields and soybeans as the primary crops. Uh, um, people, they have maybe about 100,000 people or so. So we are um, Bloomington normal. Can be people um, don't believe that our town is called normal, <laughs> right? So there's a lot of jokes that happens. Illinois state is actually situated in normal. But moving here and 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 then we've been in normal for almost um, 29 years or so. So that seems very incredible. Uh, we thought we'll stay here for a few years, move on to North Carolina or somewhere else, which is more diverse, uh, um, at least much diverse than, <laughs> than central Illinois. Um, but it was the community uh, that was extremely welcoming, predominantly white community. But the community is very different. I think Illinois as a state itself is very different. It's a little more welcoming state. And um, so the community, like when I, when I had kids, um, again, I didn't know this language, right? I was, I was kind of struggling uh, as an artist, designer, but I did get a job and I was working just as fine, uh, un undergoing racism, uh, being marginalized and stereotyped, but I did not know whom to speak up to or speak to even, right? The Indian community usually lives in a bubble because uh, it's very sheltered. And then, because um, it's easy to be that way, right? You interact with other com people of other communities at work, but then you come back home and then you spend the weekend within your own communities because there is that sense of belonging, right? So, and that's what I was doing as well. When my daughter, and I was very involved in the Indian uh, organizations locally, and uh, and I would kind of, um, as a leader, I would go, uh, like, you know, communicate or be like the voice representing the Indian community at various occasions uh, locally. But then again, I would come back home feeling othered, right? But when my daughter was in first grade, 
And then she came back home one day saying, um, um, I'm not beautiful. I'm not pretty. And then, uh, and I said, why not? She said, because I don't have uh, golden hair and, and golden curly hair. Uh, and then, so then I did not know what to say. I very shamelessly gave this answer. And I said, my daughter's name is Aishwarya. And Aishwarya Rai is one of the um, very well-known Indian film uh, actress. And, uh, and at once, uh, Julia Roberts had made a comment saying that Aishwarya Rai is one of the most beautiful women in the world many years ago. I recall that statement that uh, Julia Roberts had made and told my daughter, Aishwarya Rai is, is also our color. She has our complexion. She's got our kind of hair. And Julia Roberts regards her as the most beautiful woman in the world. So you are beautiful too. That's what I told her. My daughter just stared at me because she doesn't know who Aishwarya Rai is. She doesn't know who Julia Roberts is, right? So she didn't know what I was saying. But that whatever I told my daughter was not really to satisfy her, but it was to satisfy myself, my ego, my anger, right? My frustration. And that's when I paused. And then I realized I need to do something, right? And then I also started noticing how our um, Asian identity was kind of not as respected, invisible. We are, us immigrants are usually seen as immigrant workers, laborers, but not really seen in leadership positions. So then I thought, okay, what can I do? That's when I decided to go to grad school. I quit my job as a designer, go to grad school. My husband said, who's going to pay for this? I was just lucky that the U of I accepted me with a, um, with a fellowship and then they, they paid for my tuition. So that was wonderful. And, um, and then coming back. So when I was a student, that's when I decided I need to do um, work in cultural identity and design. Again, back then, nobody was doing. It was just me alone trying to navigate, but I didn't give up. And I think as a grad student, I found the power of design. I, I felt like it was it was really important for me to find the right thesis advisor. And I'm really fortunate for her advice. Her name is Jennifer Gunji. She's now the director of Japan House. In those days, she used to be the chair of the program, an amazing woman, an incredible advisor. And, uh, and I needed that. You know, you need somebody to kind of push you. And so that was my my calling. And since then, I've never looked back and I've gotten that agency to speak up as a designer and also as an educator. So I wanted to go into education where that's where I can create change, right? I can I can talk to young minds like you all and be so I can create that change and be like, oh, how can you be more mindful? How can you be more understanding? So it took some time uh, for me to do that. So I've been in the country for almost 34 years or so now. And then, um, so for the past maybe 20 years or so, I've been pretty vocal. And I'm very active in the local community. Uh, and um, yeah, so hopefully that answered your question. No, that was great, thank you. Yeah, thank you for taking your time to answer these questions so thoroughly, that was great. Um, another one we have is, you mentioned how your mediums for creative expression vary greatly. How do you determine which medium you choose for a certain subject? Okay, that's hard, isn't it, as designers? We're like, you know, because graphic design has just changed over the years. When I was a student, it was print design. We had just gotten into computers. And then my um, my faculty members at that time were still doing all the pay stuff, like, you know. Uh, but then the computers that we, we had were just so large and whatnot. And... Um, so learning all these new programs and everything. Uh, I think back in 96, I took my first HTML class and learned to code. Uh, I was also a web designer for a while. Um, but then it was just like, you know, all these programs. And then so again, design is changing rapidly. And I don't know whether graphic design is the right word anymore, right? 
because now we also have to do video and then like you know you need to do animation and there's like uh, and you're learning all these softwares and after effects is something that everybody wants to learn and whatnot so as you're doing all these things and then as a designer um you in your head you're like so how do i express this right i write a lot so before i start any project i read and i write so the the writings that i do will dictate and tell give me ideas of what this project needs to be and if i don't know how to do something for example like the voice project that i did i did not know after effects 16 17 years ago i sat and i learned it myself like you know i put Give, give myself a month and I can't call myself a master of After Effects, but I know what to do for my project. So I learn and depending on what I need to do. And for an installation again, so I started doing installations as a grad student and I wanted this immersive experience, right? And then that then I started thinking like, okay, how can I, I love to cook. And then, so I was like, so how can I bring food and design together, right? How can I create this immersive experiences where people can actually feel textures in their mouth, right? Because the process of cooking is similar to design. So how can they feel this immersive experience and get an understanding Standing where you design with your senses, right? You create an experience for these people. And then you're also thinking about immersing, like all you're engaging all your six senses, the six senses being your mind. So how do you react to these things? Because as you're doing something, your mind is also telling you some, something else, right? So I want people to kind of reflect upon that and write upon that as well. So there is a little bit of writing, a little bit of participation, and then there's also a little bit of performance. Like at, for this Let's Chart event, there was a little bit of performance that I did and I'm making all this and then people are engaged in certain ways. So, and again, the work actually dictates what it needs to be. Awesome, thank you. The next question is kind of more of a two-part question. Um, so among your body of work, and you've shown us some really cool stuff already, um, could you highlight one project that you consider among your greatest achievements? And along with this, what challenges did this present to you and how did you navigate them to create a successful design? Like you're saying, like if, if I had challenges when I'm designing something? Yeah, if there was like a particular project that you really loved that had challenges maybe or like separate that's kind of a loaded question but um either one i think i think we designers if you want i mean people say that we designers are problem solvers right but we are not only solving problem in terms of um with in terms of commercial success for our clients right with client-based work we are talking about um, solving client problems, right? We are trying to do, even if it's a branding project or some kind of a promotion that we are trying to create for them. So we are still trying to solve their problems. But then how can we also engage ourselves in, in a larger societal problems, right? Where we can think about design in terms of social impact uh, or creating some kind of an awareness, right? Um, so, and all I, I find like all of the projects that I've been engaged recently are I I choose my project where it's a learning moment for me because we all learn every day, right? So they're all each project kind of brings its own challenges where we have to do research. We are not masters of everything, right? We have to still go to the library. Sometimes Google doesn't really give us everything. So we still need books. You talk to subject matter experts, right? So then again, I'm not a I'm not I don't know everything. So I collaborate with a lot of folks and then uh, and then chat with them, have a conversation, try to understand. So most of these projects that I'm doing are very complex. Like I'm a Hindu. I don't know much about the Muslim community, even though I grew up in a Muslim community with, along with Muslim friends. But then talking about the hijab is totally different on a different level, right? So I really need to make that kind of research and be like, what does it mean? for people to wear the hijab? What does it mean for them to be asked to take out the hijab, right? So it's like almost like asking the unveiling of a sari, isn't it? So that's like a stripping of your identity. So these, these projects are very complicated. They're very complex. Um, but then I find... I find myself being very interested and drawn in these kind of social projects or political projects that kind of bring greater insights uh, and that I can share with people. 
that looks very superficial from the outside, you know. Perfect. Thank you. Okay, I think they said one more question from me and then we'll conclude. So the last one that I want to ask is um, reflecting on your journey as a designer, what advice would you offer to your younger self for starting out in the creative field? My younger self, boy, that was so many years ago. <laughs> I think um, not to be afraid, right? Because um, I came to this country as a 19-year-old, um, very afraid. Um, and then people would ask certain questions that I didn't know, I didn't have answers I have been asked questions where people would be like, my classmates would ask me questions where, um, are they, um, are they cars in India or do you guys go on elephants? And then there was a time I was so frustrated and I said, uh, yeah, we do ride on elephants, but parking is a problem. So, <laughs> right. I just made it humorous for myself. Right. So I wish I wasn't afraid I wish I didn't have that fear to speak up. I wish I had a mentor who would understand that we have language like what we have today. I wish we had more books like how we have today, right? The, um, the Black designers are just doing amazing work right now. And, uh, and I'm totally inspired by them. And some of them are good friends. And I'm just... I'm very, very much inspired by them. All of the amazing books that they're coming out with, the Black Conference in Design is happening uh, pretty soon. Uh, and I'm just proud of all of my friends who are working so hard. And I'm totally inspired by them. And I'm like, okay, as a South Asian woman, how can I create a voice for other South Asian people where they don't feel left out like how I felt left out uh, as a student or also in academia? So now I think we are all coming together. So there is some voice, some representation. Uh, yeah, I wish we had all of this equity language many, many, many years ago. Perfect. Thank you. You've done an amazing job. Thank you. Thank you uh, so much. I think one of my, as a public historian, there are so many intersections between the type of work that you're doing. And I can't wait to share this talk, your links with my community who may not be looking at the design field, although we collaborate with artists and others, uh, just as you do, uh, that this is, uh, if I take away anything, it's how our work can build community and the, the natures of those concentric communities. Uh, and uh, I encourage everyone to come back to the video, come back to the links, contact us at DMD. If you can't find material, the, all the QR codes will be still in this video uh, for your access. And so in closing, I just really uh, want to thank you, Archina. The talk has been so richly layered, informative, inspirational, and your honesty and generosity with us this evening. And I also want to uh, thank uh, Heather for leading us off our show producer behind the screen, Sabrina, and also Kaylee, Zoe, and our DMD 3998 uh, class for preparing questions. Everyone is invited to join us for our future Diverse Perspective speakers, and we invite you to check out the entire lineup on our Diverse Perspectives in Digital Media and Design 2024 speaker series which is at dmd.ucon.edu backslash diverse. And don't forget to subscribe to us here on YouTube and to follow our other social media channels under the at UConn DMD handle and to see our department's great uh, content. So again, thank you to everyone who put together this event, but thank you most of all to our speaker tonight and uh, 
we all have work to do. And this is the kind of inspiration, hope, example, and forthcoming books that we can tap into as a community to change our digital world for the better. And thank you for sharing your current work. Uh, so much for us to dig into. So thanks again to our online audience. And with that, we will conclude our evening together. Thank you so much, everybody. I really appreciate this opportunity for making this happen. Uh, Clarissa, Zoe, Kaylee, and, and all of the students and everybody watching and Heather, uh, I really appreciate this. Uh, thanks for the opportunity. And you all have a wonderful semester. And, uh, and namaste. Namaste.